Good afternoon, and welcome to the panel discussion for Unseen. My name is Meg Gatiss, and I will be moderating this afternoon's panel discussion. I am FinFin's Director of Community Living in the Developmental Services Division and work with persons supported to increase their skills to live more independently in the community. Joining me today is a distinguished group of panelists who bring both personal and professional experience to these topics. Similar to the last discussion, I'll start us off with a brief introduction of everyone, then we will discuss a bit about the film topics before turning to the live question and answer portion. Just as a reminder, you can submit questions in the chat at any time during our discussion. Also, if you'd like to learn more about our panelists, you can read their full bios on VenFin's Film Festival website. So, a little about each of the panelists. First, it is my pleasure to introduce Jess Rodney. As you see in the film, Jess and her husband Ryan are parents to their eight beautiful children, including their son Lucas, who has profound special needs. Among many things, Jess is an author, speaker, caregiver, advocate, and founder of the Lucas Project. She is was going to be joined by her husband, Ryan, who has childcare duties this afternoon, but he works, uh, besides being a full-time father, of course, as a house flipper and advocate for special needs families. Next, we have Hillary Dunn Stannis. Hillary is a senior attorney at the Disability Law Center, where she focuses on advocating for community supports for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and special education matters. Hillary has an older brother with Angelman syndrome and has devoted her career to assisting individuals with disabilities and their families. Next joining us, we have Zach Rossetti. Zach is an associate professor at Boston University's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. His research focuses on social interactions and friendships between students with and without intellectual and developmental disabilities. And Zach's inspiration comes from his brother, Todd, who was a huge Boston sports fan, had cerebral palsy, and needed constant support to get through each day. Finally, joining us, we have Caitlin Spencer, Area Director at the Department of Developmental Services, Greater Boston. In her current role, Kate oversees residential contracts for over 200 group homes and monitors the children's and transitional services area. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Now let's start off with a question for Jess. Jess, thank you so much for sharing this very personal family experience with us in the film. In, in the film, you're honest about the real daily challenges that you, Lucas, and the rest of your family experience. You speak candidly about the physical and mental toll being a full-time caregiver has taken. Please tell us how your family is doing since the filming of Unseen. Well, we've had a lot of changes occur. Um, since we wrapped up filming, we have moved again. Um, we moved from Tennessee back to my hometown in Michigan, where we were hopeful that even if we couldn't find any resources or support, at least we would have friends and family to help us out. Um, and that has been a really positive change for our family. Um, we built an accessible home um, that works perfectly with our situation with Lucas as he's aging. Um, we've gotten a lot of more, a lot more resources and support here. Michigan is just set up in a very different way than Tennessee was. And um, we have school for Luke until he's 26 years old here. Um, and that's year round school, which is huge. And I wish more states would consider that um, for special needs families, because just to have that purposeful environment for Lucas to go um, on a daily basis is so helpful as a caregiver. Um, we launched two boys off to college, so we're down to just six kids at home. Um, we still have eight, but <laughs> just six that we're managing on a daily basis. Um, I wrote another book about my life, so that now makes three. Uh, that book is called Loving with Grit and Grace and was just launched February 14. 
And um, the Lucas Project has grown considerably, which has been fun. Um, Ryan also changed careers. He is now a house inspector and for the first time has been able to pursue full-time employment because we feel much more supported in our caregiving roles here through the resources that we have. Um, and we are cr currently creating a future residential option for our son, Lucas, and a couple of his friends. Um, we don't have all the details on how that's going to pan out yet, but it's been an exciting process and kind of a frustrating process <laughs> and a process full of learning curves, but we're just really excited to see how this all pans out. That is a whole lot mm -hmm. in a very short time since yes. the filming. <laughs> you guys are extremely busy, but so great about the, all the positive changes. So just staying with you for another question, um, your other children appear in many of the scenes assisting Lucas. Siblings of people with disabilities can certainly be affected differently, depending on many factors. First, I'm wondering if you could share a bit about their reflections on their experience. And then second, as siblings of someone with a disability, uh, I'll turn to Hillary and Zach, if you both could share a bit about the impact of having a sibling with an intellectual disability and how what the impact has been on your lives. So Jess, if you want to start off, please. So from the siblings perspective, um, I would say, I mean, we have siblings who are uh, very empathetic and helpful with Lucas. And then we have siblings who are very indifferent and it's just my brother, whatever. Um, I can tell you, like, as a mom, I've experienced a lot of guilt in the past about the amount of care that Lucas takes and the fact that the other kids don't get as much individualized attention. And I've had to work through a lot of feelings in regards to that as a mom. Um, and as a family, we really operate as a team. And that's kind of what we preach to our kids, what we try to demonstrate to our kids. And although we don't have a lot of that individualized time, we do gather around the dinner table every night and we catch up with all of the kids and we ask them how they're doing. And we go to the park with Lucas. And um, I know um, some of my children have mentioned feelings of um, sort of like, it's not fair, this idea of Lucas does get so much of your attention, but there are other children who recognize that that's just what he needs and they definitely step in and try to help out with that. I would say our whole goal in creating a future option for Lucas is so that our children don't feel like that's their problem to have to deal with the rest of their life, his care. Um, and we want that. We want them to be, feel free to have their own lives um, without necessarily putting that on them that they're the next in line to care for Lucas. Um, so I think they see that as a positive. I think, did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's very helpful um, information and great insight on their own experiences. Hillary and Zach, would you care to add? Sure, I think I'll, I'll go first and Zach can fill in what everything that I miss. Um, so, <laughs> I think there's kind of the the impact um, growing up, you know, there's that part of it to think about and then kind of what Jess was referencing, the the, the future, right, of what that, that looks like when, when mom and dad aren't um, able to be the, the full-time caregivers or aren't around anymore or whatever. Um, so I think, you know, growing up, um, my take is that anybody who would characterize it as either a positive or negative experience is, I don't really like that framework. I think it's, it's a complex nuanced experience um, with ups and downs and some really unique opportunities um, and some challenges that if we don't acknowledge it, it's not being like genuine of the experience. Um, but, you know, my, my brother's my brother at the end of the day. So I have a brother, um, but his unique, um, He's given me some unique gifts because he does have Angelman syndrome. He is my older brother. I don't know what it's like to, to not have a brother <laughs> with disabilities. That's all I've ever known. Um, and he does require um, really kind of like 24 seven support needs, really high support needs. Um, but you know what? He, he, he gave me 
a career path. He gave me um, some passion for a sense of like fairness and justice that certainly extends outside of kind of specifically the disability community, but just kind of, um, you know, thinking that equality is important, inclusion is important, and that really touches on so much of our society. Um, I think a lot of siblings, as kind of just mentioned that, that some kind of really do gravitate towards having a, a sense of empathy that's really beyond their years. Um, and, you know, some of the challenging stuff growing up was, of course, there's, you know, your parents don't have our, uh, as much time for, for your um, wants, desires, and needs, and kind of working through that. And as a young child, you don't have the the vocabulary to really express what you're feeling. And um, that can be really challenging at times. Uh, I think I'm probably pretty similar to, well, I would say there's a lot of siblings, I think that have had similar experiences to me of feeling this kind of, your parents could be doing like the most wonderful job in the world, but you see how much your brother or sister, like what their care needs are and that your parents don't have all the supports that they need and you kind of internalize that as therefore like, I need to be perfect. I need to be an overachiever. Like I don't wanna create any burdens for them or anything that, that's gonna be a problem. So, you know, I'd say those are some of the things that kind of came from my experience. And like I said, I think there's, that's kind of some unique opportunities. I think there's some challenges there there too. Um, and I think as you, we think about what the future is, um, well, and I guess I should say some of the challenges, they're not my, I, it's not my brother. It's not Chris, it's society. The challenges are, um, you know, I don't think that young children, you know, whether it was myself or Zach or other siblings, um, I don't think we should have to be witnessing discrimination. I don't think we should have to um, deal with like devaluing of, of, of human beings and like abuse and things like that when you're a child. Um, and that's not, any that's a society problem of how we value people with disabilities so that challenge has nothing to do with my brother as a person that's how society has to do better um and and work better with families with people with disabilities um you know i think why don't i pause there i guess zach maybe you can talk to you if you want me to talk about some of the future planning stuff i can but i'll see what you have to add i talked a lot <laughs> Sure. Um, I would definitely echo the complexity, I think, best described um, by having unique opportunities and unique challenges. I'm the oldest of six in my family. My brother Todd was the fourth uh, one of us. Um, and as the oldest, I did a lot of the caregiving um, I don't know which was first, my kind of connection um, with Todd or the caregiving, but um, I was probably the closest with uh, my brother Todd, other than our mom. Uh, my other siblings love him, of course, but maybe a little more indifferent. Um, as Jess said, when I went off to college, they all had their successive turns of, you know, helping with him. Um, and, you know, part of the uniqueness is how each family operates and all of the other factors, right? Like Todd also needed 24 seven care. Um, he used a wheelchair. He did not speak, <clears throat> excuse me. He didn't have any behavioral challenges or aggression, I think due to his disability of cerebral palsy. Um, it was more just an inability to, you know, move his body and he didn't have a communication system. Um, people thought he had an intellectual disability. To the day I die, I will challenge that. I think he didn't have the ability to communicate um, all that he does know. Um, I, Growing up, I used to ask him little questions all the time. Where did Graham sit at Thanksgiving? And he'd immediately look over there. Or if we got in a fight, other siblings were in a fight, he'd get upset or get mad at one of us. Or like he, he's very much present in responding appropriately. He just didn't have that communication uh, uh, system. Um, but that's that the type of disability, the age of the siblings, the way the family operates, resources, all of these kind of factor in, right? Like with, you know, the aggression and behavioral challenges can be, um, can be very hard. 
um, you know, the, the way we operated, you know, in our family was just as inclusive, trying to be as inclusive as possible. And, and, um, you know, I think as we saw in the film too, like making it work with the trips to the park, we would, when we would go to the park because Todd couldn't control his body, I'd usually, one of us usually had to be on bug patrol um, because he would get the worst mosquito bites you could ever see because he would feel a mosquito on him and probably think, oh, this stinks. I wish this mosquito wasn't biting me, but he couldn't move his body to wipe it off. So we figured that out over time. And that's just one little example, um, you know, of, of some of the, you know, things that families are, are dealing with. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Massachusetts Sibling Support Network as well. So I just wanted to say that um, for families who are thinking about uh, um, caregiving and also sibling issues, beyond these unique opportunities and challenges, siblings because of lack of options sometimes in the, in the um, workforce crisis that, that clearly was shown in the film, siblings are sometimes um, are oftentimes involved in some capacity as um, adults. And the Massachusetts Sibling Support Network is um, a local organization, state organization, um, state chapter of the National Sibling Leadership Network that offers supports, resources, information to uh, families. And so there are um, services and information. We offer presentations um, geared towards younger siblings. We offer uh, networking, get togethers, information, training um, for adult siblings as well. That is amazing. Thank you all three for your very thoughtful answers. That was that was very informative and also great to get sort of a, a personal sense of your own experiences. Uh, Zach, thank you also for mentioning the support network uh, for siblings. I'm hoping every state has such an organization and um, that I'm sure is extremely helpful to a lot of, of people in support roles. So moving on to our next question. After viewing the film Unseen, certainly it certainly seems to be an accurate description of how most full-time caregivers feel about how they are sometimes perceived in their community. There were several people in the film who described not, not only having ac limited access to community resources, but feeling very excluded in their community to the point of receiving very rude comments when out in their own neighborhoods. This is a question for everyone in the panel. What specific actions can people in the community take to support caregivers and other family members? I'll, uh, I can start off. Thank you. Cool ideas um, that I think are in, informed by being a sibling, but also my job, as, as I work at the Disability Law Center, I work doing disability rights work every day and work with families and people with disabilities every day. Um, and I am also mom to a very young child, almost two, uh, who um, has some pretty involved medical needs. So kind of all those experiences, here's a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, every person's different, but I would say something as basic as like, don't ask the family, the caregiver, like how you can help. Give them specific options, like concrete things. Like I know that's such a small thing, but the number of times people say, you know, oh, how can I help? Or um, let me know if you need help, right? That's adding one more like action item to a caregiver's checklist of the thousand things they have to get done. Instead, it's kind of, you know, say you're, involved with a family that does have a kid that ends up, you know, in the hospital sometimes, and that family has other kids at home. So maybe you could just say, you know what, do you, what would be more helpful? Some home cooked meals or, you know, spending some time watching your other kids so that mom and dad can both be at the hospital together instead of trying to juggle that, right? Um, I don't know, just kind of offering, I, I found like the concrete things and helping like tangibly take something off somebody's list. It sounds so small, but that is just 
as a community member that may or may not be part of the quote unquote disability community, like that's something that you can very easily do. Um, otherwise, I, I would just really encourage our communities to normalize disability, right? Like we, our families have just as much of a right to be out and about in the world as any other family. Um, you know, the rude comments, the rude stares, like, and they're done that. I was the obnoxious 12 year old that flipped you off when you stared at my family. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's but, one coping strategy. Yeah, right. <laughs> Probably, you know, not the best, but you know, I was obnoxious tween, right? So, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's really this idea of you know, if we just kind of preach inclusion, it's it's a hollow preaching, right? We have to practice what we preach. And and that's stop putting the onus on the families of and the people with disabilities. That that's a societal, it's a community obligation is to practice inclusion and, and provide integration opportunities. The burden is not on the people with disabilities and their families. So I think there's just, you know, those are my couple thoughts off the top of my head. I'll turn it over to others. Yeah, I would piggyback off of that, too, to say um, caregivers to do lists are never ending. So I think even not having an expectation that you have to help with the child with disabilities, I think that often keeps people away from offering help, but recognizing there are so many things that you can help with. And I'll often say to people, just say, um, I'm bringing you a meal Wednesday evening, lasagna or tacos. Like you said, Hillary, don't leave it open-ended. And then going back to the siblings too, the siblings have to miss out on so much because there is a disability. And I know for our situation, Lucas doesn't like his routine interrupted. So we're not all going to go to the high school football game or basketball game or whatever the school, the family fun night is, you know, offered at the school. But if you, society could help with the siblings and offer to take them and bring them home so that either mom or dad can stay home with Lucas. That's huge as a parent to feel like my kids don't have to miss out on everything because I'm not going to put Lucas in the car, disrupt his whole routine, bring him to this sensory overload environment that's going to drive him crazy and he's going to scream and then we're all going to go back home. So I think that is such a simple way to help out a family like mine is just to offer those rides for those siblings so that they can participate in so many of the fun activities that they often miss out on. That's great. Very practical advice from both of you. Very much appreciated. Um, so, Caitlin, I want to pull you into the conversation here. And um, when we speak about community resources, we know they vary from state to state and can be dependent on what may be available locally to families. In Massachusetts, the Department of Developmental Services provides funding for many children and adults with intellectual disabilities. And Caitlin, as the area director of the Greater Boston Area DDS office, could you share a bit about the current service models available to both to families and adults? Sure. I think um, through the Department of De Developmental Services in Massachusetts, most of the adult services come at the age of 22, which I know Jess said in Michigan, it's 26, which is amazing. <laughs> um, so just some of the different service models that DDS has are, you know, we have the traditional services in which we call, we DDS contracts directly with agencies. Um, you know, we offer day supports, which include a few different service models. They can be community-based day supports, um, group-supported employment, or employment supports if somebody's working in the community and they just need um, a check-in every week or assistance with putting in requests for time off. Um, for adult services, we offer various service models of residential. So that can be, you know, a 24-hour group home. For the Boston office, we have, I think right now we have 264 group home contracts. Um, we offer individual support. So if somebody lives by themselves in an apartment and needs anywhere from, I would say five to 30 hours a week of supports, agency staff will come out and assist them with, you know, going to the grocery store, coordinating their doctor's appointments, reading their mail. It's a variety of things that they can assist with. 
And then we also have a shared living model. That model is a 24 hour, you know, uh, it's a 24 seven model, which an individual would live in the home with maybe one of their family members and we would provide some assistance. And then we also have non-family members. So if an individual would live in a family home, um, not necessarily related to them. We also have family sports. So family sports, um, the Boston office, we have eight different family support centers that we work with, one including Ben Ben. Um, in that service, we can do family identified respite. That service is also available for children and that is through a stipend. So the family would identify a person to come in and do some respite hours and then they would pay them through a stipend. Through family support for adult services, we also offer an adult companion. So to take somebody out into the community, um, to go bowling, to go to lunch, to maybe go meet one of their friends. We also have in-home supports. So that's a skill building in the home. So rather than the family having to work with somebody, you know, to be more independent with cooking, with doing their laundry, um, it would be a worker from the agency going into the home to do that. And then we also offer navigation services. And again, that is a worker through the family support agency. So they can assist with, you know, coordinating all doctor's appointments, making sure the right prescriptions are picked up. Um, you know, we, we have a family support manual and it can go into detail as to which services can do what for families to help. Um, those are pretty much the traditional services. And then we have, the agency with choice model, it's kind of a hybrid model between self-directed services and traditional services. So there is agency oversight, but the job description for the worker is very customized to that person. So that can be, you know, somebody who lives at home with family. It can be somebody who, you know, lives independently in the community. Um, and it can be a variety of the service description it can be for day services, it can be for residential services. So it's very customized, but it does have agency oversight. So the person is an employee of the agency, but they are also able to, the person is able to identify the worker and then they'll be hired by the agency. And the agency can also help post for the position to find a worker. Um, and then the third service delivery that we have is self-directed services. So that is a person will work with their service coordinator and identify the budget and what the need of services. You develop a job description. Um, you, you, the individual or family determines what the pay rate is for that worker. Um, and then you work with your service coordinator to identify a worker. That worker is not affiliated with an agency. It is solely hired by the individual or the family member for that. So that's just kind of a general overview of the services that DDS offers in Massachusetts. That is incredibly helpful, Caitlin. And that's certainly an impressive list of all the different service models. And I know in Massachusetts, we're extremely fortunate to have such a variety of different services available. And um, I know some states look, look to Massachusetts as a model. So that's all very impressive and very helpful. So um, I wanted to switch now to talk a little bit about uh, different questions. We're getting some different great questions from the audience members and starting with, um, and anybody on the panel can sure feel free to answer this. How can we advocate for getting change? Changes made to our system and, and better funding and, and better uh, services even than what we have. So I have a couple of very um, concrete ways that, um, at least in Massachusetts, this is for Massachusetts, so I'm sorry <laughs> for people outside of the state. Um, but I mean, I think in general, for everybody, from a national standpoint, it's, um, you know, talking to your state reps, right? You'd be, ama you'd be amazed how much they actually care about, like, their individual constituents. You know, they don't, may, might not necessarily understand or know much about like the disability world and then when you finite that down to like profound disability you know they might not have a lot of knowledge on that but um they do care about getting reelected, and they do care about individual constituent issues so just kind of you know never underestimate your power as a voter right <laughs> it's just like a general kind of part of it um but like you know 
this is in, 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 in a lot of ways, a small community, right? We need allies. Um, this can't just be the intellectual developmental disability community's problem, right? This, we need allies, um, our friends, our, our family as a community at large needs to acknowledge that if, um, if we, if our safety net services fail to the point that we rely solely on family member caregivers, like this is, we are in a crisis and it's going to get even worse. If this was any other population outside of people with significant disabilities, like this would be unacceptable. It would be unacceptable to say, oh, you can't get out of your house because, you know, you're stuck in your house or you can't get to a doctor's appointment or, you know, you have no choice in your life. Um, somebody else makes all those choices for you. Like this would be unacceptable if it was any other population. Um, and I just, I don't know, that's how I try to talk to like friends, families, is trying to get people jazzed about it in that way. Um, with that said, I think there's two, really kind of um, concrete things. Number one is in Massachusetts, we have a few bills pending right now that you could very easily, if you chose to, um, contact your state representative and state senator. Um, one okay. is about it, the raising the workforce rates. Because let's think about like, I mean, Justice Film it, and all the families in that, it's really about all this caregiving that the family members have to do because their service system is failing. If our service system functions and we were able to address the massive workforce crisis that we had, if we had available PCAs, if we had a robust direct care workforce, the caregiving family members would have to provide could perhaps be more reasonable. <laughs> um, so workforce increase, increasing our workforce um, pay rates is, is there's a bill pending right now that would impact the Department of Developmental Services and Mass Health um, Services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The House bill is 171, the Senate bill is 83. Uh, secondarily, there is um, another bill that would allow, uh, it would change so that um, a guardian, somebody who's legally responsible for somebody, often a parent or a sibling, um, if that person with a disability requires that level of, of um, care, uh, that they could be paid as a caregiver. They could be a paid PCA or paid um, as an AFC care provider without having to give up adult foster care care provider without having to give up guardianship. Um, this is a band-aid in my opinion. This doesn't address that. It just allows a family member to be paid for the care that they're like providing to the world for free right now. Um, but that bill is House 1232 and Senate Bill 775. So those are some real concrete steps if you, you know, that could have a real tangible impact on improving caregivers' lives. So. And Thanks so much, Hillary. You're an amazing advocate. And, and I, you probably are aware, but at Venfin, we have um, many staff and many self-advocates who attend Caring Force rallies at the State House and really do our best to speak up for these very issues. So we're all very involved with with all of that, doing our part. And it's it's been effective. We just need to keep going. So thank you so much. Um, another question for the audience, and this one is to you, Zach. Um, in the film, Jess says the child is only as healthy as the caregiver. So Zach, they're curious to know what this means to you, both as a special educator and now as an educator at the university level. What can educators do to support the caregiver as they support students at home? Oh, thank you. I, I, that's a really important question. I think that um, the school situation is incredibly important. Um, in a lot of the research that I've done with families, um, families often say, I am happy to advocate for my child. I'm happy, um, you know, to a degree. It, it shouldn't be as hard as it is. So I think one thing that school professionals can do all the way up through adult services as well is to be aware of what families are going through. And, and this film is, is a powerful uh, reminder of that. And try to make things just a little easier. A lot of parents, you know, the first child with a disability they might know is, is their own child and are learning all of these systems and learning to advocate and trying to figure things out. And it takes a lot of time. And, and if, if 
you know, if, if there if there have to be battles along the way, if if you finally figure out what to do and then you look and there are no good options that you would want your child in for after school or they won't take your child as in the film, um, you know, that was, was an example. It, it makes it that much harder. Um, one of the things that we stress that I stress in all of my courses um, to future teachers is that you can provide and should provide as much information as possible to families. You have a special ed degree, you're a special education teacher, hopefully you have a sense of, of what school should provide, of what transition should look like, of what adult services should look like, and, and share information with families so they don't have to feel like they're on their own. Um, and I mentioned earlier with my brother, one of the big factors with him was his lack of communication. Um, you know, we figured out he communicated. He had some, uh, he didn't speak, he had some vocalization. We asked him questions and gave him choices and, and he conveyed a response that way. It was very, it was not a comprehensive augmentative alternative communication system. But for anyone who doesn't have a comprehensive system and doesn't speak, I think that should be the first priority in schools. Um, and, and from there, uh, lots of participation and engagement um, can happen. And certainly transition has improved over the years, but transition still could be a lot better, a lot more effective so that students have uh, smoother transitions from school to adult living, employment, post-secondary education, leisure, social activities, all of these things that weren't happening in the film, um, you know, are, are things that school professionals can do and link up with the, uh, the adult world to help out a little, make things a little easier for families. That's some excellent advice. Thank you so much, Zach. We, my, can I just say, I just, my sister is a special ed teacher. So okay. there's three of us. There's my sister, me, and my, my brother in disability. And just to, like, in a really general sense, this she said this to me once when I was going to sit on a, you know, sibling panel and talk about sibling experience to answer the question of, like, what can school folks or adult service providers in general, like, what's one thing you would tell them, right? And I think something is, like, you can leave at the end of the day no matter how hard and intense um, and, and all of that is like, you can leave at the end of the day, the family can't and, and they love their child endlessly, but there's not an end. Um, so, so that, that's a, it's a level of respect to show, right? Like at, they need to respect their experience um, and acknowledge that sometimes when the service systems aren't working instead of being defensive and fighting about it, it's, they're not working you deserve better, but they're, you know, they're not working right now, whatever, instead of like arguing about it, it's, it's your job, you get to leave, the family doesn't. So. Right, that's, that's uh, very impactful. The, just what you said is, is pretty incredible to think about. So thank you for adding. Uh, an, another audience question for everyone, what is the caregiver and person served divide experience by people in poverty? So um, in other words, what what is the experience with the caregiver and person served? Um, how is that experienced by people in poverty? Do we have a sense of, of that from our personal, our professional experiences? Anybody want to speak to that? Yeah, I, the first thing that comes to mind is that both in special education and, you know, as we saw in the film with adult services, there's a lot of. Um, advocacy required by families. There's an expectation of advocacy almost that is an unfair burden. Participation, of course, because families are the experts on their kids. And especially when a child doesn't speak, can help convey um, what they think uh, is best and, and all of that. Um, but advocacy takes time, and effort, and resources. And if you are um, impoverished, you are probably, um, and in poverty, you're probably worrying about other uh, things as well, and your time and energy are spent there, and you are not advocating as much as others, and, and in both school and adult systems, the squeaky wheel gets the services, I guess, 
And so lots of families are probably going without. And, and you know, I would add, I've worked with a lot of immigrant families and, and English and families who are learning English and learning, you know, new systems and, and probably aren't aware of what they could be advocating for, even if they could advocate for it. That's that's very insightful as well, Zach. Thank you so much for your response. Um, this is a question, Jess. Um, can you speak um, uh, just a bit more about your experience in trying to balance caregiving and making a living to support your family? That's another audience question someone is wondering. Yeah, it's been a constant juggling act for our family, just sort of piecing together this existence. Um, and as we, I believe, stated in the film, Ryan was a landlord. We had some rental properties and then he was doing house flips and we would just sort of work that around the caregiving experience. So when everything was working well and Luke wasn't in ICU and we had help, then he would like flip, he would work on his flip house for like 80 hours a week. <laughs> and then when we would have to take a break, we'd take a break. And as I mean, most people know about what I do. I I am the executive director of the Lucas Project, which I started in 2017. Um, and I am able to work for home. I'm also an author and a speaker. So I've been able to move further in my career since we moved back to Michigan, um, because now we have systems in place where we have help almost every day after school for Lucas. When we were in Tennessee, we were just floundering. We were piecemealing together this thing that kind of looked like making a living. <laughs> and then, um, so we do feel much more supported now. And I would say too, in terms of our siblings or Luke's siblings, we have an allowance system in place where they can earn some money to help out with Lucas's care. So we have tapped into that in the past, even with after school help so that mom and dad can continue to work and provide a life for them. Um, and then we pay them to help out with Lucas after school while I'm still in the house. So that's not something we force on them. They love to make the extra money and that has worked well for our family. Yeah. And of course, they know Lucas so well, so that mm -hmm. benefits him greatly to be with somebody that he knows and loves. So uh, one last question, and this audience question is for you, Caitlin. How is the Commonwealth trying to ensure that they support caregivers and or ensure that there is a safety net for families? Mm -hmm. So as far as family caregivers, um, we work, like I said, we have eight family support agencies in the greater Boston office. Um, over the past three years since I've been in this position, we have tried to be creative for different programs for caregivers. So, you know, we have vacation programs. We are trying to increase the amount of hours we can put into the home. We have worked with service coordinators to try to, um, you know, utilize different services other than just DDS too on top of it to get more help inside the home, um, you know, through PCA services or through different types of healthcare that can come into the home. Um, we have, you know, I think some of the family support center stuff is we do, you know, a lot of the stuff we're doing now is for family caregivers and vacations. So sometimes, you know, whether they want their family member to go away for a week or a month with one of with staff, but they also offer different things where they'll, you know, rent out houses down the Cape and the entire family can go. Um, and then they'll provide some staffing on top of that while the whole family is on vacation. So th they would provide an agency staff so the family can go out and do different activities that their loved one with the disability may not want to do or you know, may not physically be able to do. So we have been trying to amp up the services through our family support centers. Um, the family support centers also work together. So if they're offering different events or if they have different resources, they will come together. They meet, I think, quarterly to go over what they've been doing and the feedback from the families. Um, we do a lot of surveys with the families to see how we can, you know, what would benefit them. I think you guys talked about, um, you know, like when Hillary was saying, don't just 
you know, offer what you can do, you know, just actually do something. So we try to do that through the centers that we know the family would benefit from this, have this available to them instead of waiting for them to come to us to ask something. We try to have the services readily available. The Family Resource Centers certainly sound like a fabulous resource for families and, and individuals both. So thank you for telling us about that as yeah. a resource. We do, sorry, we do have um, culturally linguistic family support centers in the Boston area as well. So That's very that important. Helpful. Yep. And but, Massachusetts is doing a good, uh, uh, starting to, to do a good job to acknowledge that Family support does not equal parent support, that family support has to equal like support, including siblings, we all get older. And if the adult siblings are expected to be um, part of the caregiving or decision-making team, like the family, it has to include the whole family. So I think Massachusetts, at least this is really starting to recognize and take some steps towards that. And that's important. I'd encourage everybody to do it. Absolutely. That's a very important point. So, at this point, we're gonna. This concludes the second set of a film and live panel discussion. Thank you to the panel. I appreciate all of your input, and thank you for everyone for joining us this afternoon.